Discover Help presents Stress-Free Living with Ray Savage and Mr. Stress-Free, Ratanjit S. Sandhi. This audio program is an unscripted and unrehearsed conversation between Ray and Ratanjit. It is shared with you in hope of adding value to your life. We encourage you to listen to this program in its entirety to receive the full impact of its message. Sit back, relax, open your heart, mind, and soul to this edition of Stress-Free Living. And welcome to Stress-Free Living. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Ray Samich and our co-host as always, Mr. Ratanjit Sandy. Ratanjit, how are you this fine day? Wonderful, Ray. Good to have your voice back. Last, last session, you're, you lost your voice. Where did you find it? <laughs> you know, we talk about being grateful, uh, Ratanjit, and we overlook just some of the very basic things. You know, we, we wake up every day and everything is working for the most part, and we just continue to go about. And then when you do go through a few days where you don't have something as basic as your voice, uh, to communicate effectively, especially if you're in the business like I am, where the voice is such an important part of what I do, um, you really do, it forces you to be grateful and, and realize how we take things for granted. So it was a good lesson that uh, the good Lord sends our way once in a while to really make us realize that don't take things for granted because whether it's a loved one or whether it's of our health or whatever it is, um, everything is a gift. Yes. So let's, let's move on to today's topic, though, because this is an intriguing one for me. You and I are both old enough. I hate to say it, Ratanji, but we, we both are, uh, are later years of our lives. And at our lives, we can remember back when we were children and people would tell us, our parents, elders would tell us, that the most important thing in our life is our integrity. The, the best thing that we have is our integrity. It's the values that we have at the core that propel us to do everything else in life. And that even if you lose everything, if you still have your ethics, if you still have your, your morals, your values, then you have something else that is something that is so powerful that you can rebuild and start again. Over our lifetime, I think we have seen that diminish. And I think that we recognize and seem to respect people that do whatever it takes to be successful, to be famous, to have money. So the question really comes down is, with everything changing in our world, do values still matter? Do, does having integrity, is that still something that people should strive for? or? Sadly, is that just something that has gone aside like so many other traditions and, and things that were there when we were children? Well, so you are so right. Actually, if you read the literature on uh, leadership and about 100 years back, if you go, and you'll find the character was the key portion of defining a leader, not money, not fame. And today it is completely money or fame. Character has no value. In fact, when I came to US in 68, at that time, the banks would have three C's. One of those C was character. And today, when the same these banks, that C is not there anymore. So suddenly our, our society has uh, chosen somehow or other by default that character doesn't matter as long as you have the technology, you have the knowledge, you have the intelligence, you, you can do things. It is all about if you can make uh, things happen, then you automatically uh, are approved. You are okay. Yeah. So and, and, and then to, to cap that off too, if you make a mistake in this new environment, if you do something even terribly wrong by moral values, by that perspective, 
all you have to do is say, you know what? I take full responsibility for my action. <laughs> okay. And then everybody says, okay, I, I give you a pass. It, it's fine. Now, you know, go back to, go back to doing what you were doing before because you, you accepted that you had responsibility, but that doesn't mean anything really. It, it just means that, okay, I acknowledged I did something wrong, but I'm going to continue doing it. Yeah, but see, the other side of the coin is in our society, when somebody does something wrong, we basically want to punish that person. And somehow punishing makes it okay. We have not learned to reform the human being so that uh, if, if, if your car makes a mistake and doesn't, uh, your brake doesn't work, you don't punish the car. You take it to your mechanic and he fixes the car. Whereas in our case, if a human being makes a mistake, and obviously why that human being makes a mistake is their database or their thinking or the whole thing is erroneous. Instead of correcting that, we punish them. We fill our jail with all these so-called criminals. They are human beings. We basically uh, either don't punish anybody, let them get away scot-free. But if we want to punish somebody, we put them in jail. So both are incorrect. You know, I have to share a funny little sidelight because you, you mentioned that we don't punish the car. But, you know, I remember as a, as a young, young man, when I had my first beater car, you know, wasn't worth a whole lot and it would fail me, I would try to punish it. If it would stop running, I would kick it or I would punch it. But you know what happened is it hurt me more than it hurt the car. <laughs> and I'd end up with a sore hand and then I still had to get it fixed anyway. So I think your analogy is, is still very true. When we do try to punish them, it doesn't really help you still have to get them fixed. And in some cases, when you punish them, it hurts you more than it hurts them. <laughs> so I think it actually validates your, your, your analogy with that. But you know, let's, let's not talk today about um, judging for wrong things. I mean, obviously, if you, if you hurt somebody, if you rob a bank, if you steal a car, I mean, those are, those are legal issues. And they're morally wrong too, but they're also legal issues. And there is a system, whether it's right or good or just is another topic, but there is a system. But I'm talking more about the things that we do day to day, especially in the business world, that, and maybe in the political world, and, and maybe in some of our religious institutions, where there's decisions being made that in the past were not acceptable and today seem to cross over where they say, well, it's okay. You know, that, that hard stop, that, that firm line seems to have gone away. And now you can kind of ease over that line and do those little things that, that my dad would have said you never do. See, see what we have done is all our values, ethics, lying or being honest and all that, we have, uh, instead of giving, keeping responsibility on the human being, we have given responsibility to our laws. So we have created laws. Mm -hmm. See, at, at, when I started my business, shake hand was a firm commitment. Okay, I will deliver this, I will do this and it is, you could take it to the bank. But today, that is not acceptable. You have to write a contract and you have to pay $20,000 to attorney for writing a contract. And then there are loopholes in that contract. So it depends on how much muscle you have, how much wealth you have, how much uh, influence you have, that contract, you can get away without fulfilling that contract. 
So our value system, which we originally uh, related to our core wealth, our core character, our core being, our true identity as our values, that we have converted that into the legal le law system, legal. Uh, so as a consequence, I don't have to worry about telling the truth. And I don't have to worry about uh, meeting my promise, which I made. I, I loosely make promises today. No, no, I, I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll do this, I'll do this. And I, I, and I don't even remember that because those promises which we make, we never meant to keep them. You, what you just said the last two minutes is so, it's so true, but it's so, it, it makes it so understanding in terms of what has happened. You, you've just summed this whole situation up, Ratanji. And so I, I hope our audience will not mind me trying to repeat it. The, by adding such a legal element to our society, where everything now has to be exactly precise, we've almost said we don't need all the verbal agreements and verbal ethics and verbal commitments because unless it is legally in writing and agreed to by both parties and signed and, and witnessed and, and everything else, notarized, okay, everything else that I can do in my life is just it doesn't really matter, you know, so that we, we have separated the two into legal obligations and moral obligations, but the moral obligations we look at as being very minimal, very, very unimportant, because if it was important, I'd put it in writing and we'd sign it with an attorney. I think that's a real critical point that you've just that. I mean, that would explain the change because at one point we didn't have any kind of a, a, a complicated, extensive, expansive legal system. The consequence of that, Ray, is that we have robbed our personal true wealth, the real personal wealth, my self-worth. My self-worth is assigned to me by my conscience what my conscience think of me, you cannot fool it. You can fool the entire world, but you cannot fool yourself. And as a consequence, we have lost the real confidence. If you see our forefathers, or they had amazing confidence, calmness about them, the real, inner peace about them. And if you see today's uh, executive, whether it's a CEO or they are pretty, uh, there's absence of real peace in them, real harmony in them. They need crutches, they need title, they need some decoration from somebody's certification to validate them. So, but, but see, the thing is this, if we reach a person's self-worth, you know, I'll, I'll share a story with you after you take the break. I think we are at the point, so just let's about. take a break. We generally delay just that. A, just about, we have a few minutes. Okay, so the story is this, that in my business, Ray, I think you know the story, but it's worth repeating that uh, a contractor, uh, we used to make waterproofing material for uh, parking decks. So we, the parking deck uh, engineers who designed this parking deck would specify the manufacturer. So we were specified by engineers on this large job. So the contractor, before they bid the job, they want prices from you. So we had two systems and they, you have to give as a manufacturer at least five year guarantee for the product. 
So I said, look, the basic five-year guarantee product, the cost is lower, but I have a product which is can last for 20 plus years and the cost is higher. So the contract says, why should I buy the higher product? I said, you are in the business of making profit. So by using our second product, your labor cost is reduced to half and your biggest cost on this project is labor cost. And also you can open the garage the same day. And it is a 100% solid system. In other words, there are no flammable solvents in the system. So after I showed him the calculation, he says, well, I would be a fool not to buy this. So he ordered that product. So after he finished the project, everything was okay. When time came to pay, we send him an invoice. He says, look, I'm going to pay you the lower price. Hmm. I said, but you bought the product with a uh, higher price. So no, no, that I, was, I was not supposed to, I did you a favor. <laughs> so <clears throat> then he brought a check and he said, take it or leave it or shoo, sue me. So at that point, Ray, what would you do? Wow. I guess I need I, I need to be honest with, with you. And I would say that I would I would take the check that he already has, but I would say you still owe me the additional amount and I would pursue getting the additional amount too. With the with the legal system. Legal There's system. a legal system, right? Right. I mean, that's what he got. He agreed to get it. He, he didn't pay for it. It's a legal deal. And so he should owe the rest of it. So I would take something to make sure I have it. And I would cash that check before he stopped payment on it. And then I would go after the rest. But see, he was counting on the legal system. First of all, it is uh, not 100% to prove that in the court, because it depends on who is your attorney. Yeah. Plus, the, plus the legal cost of that can run into hundreds of thousand dollars and plus time wasted and all that. So a normal business person would, would stay away from it and say, okay, I'll uh, count my loss and, and at least I'm getting whatever I'm getting. So what I did was I said, I'm going to reach his conscience. So I had a meeting with him. He brought his attorney and his manager and his chief financial officer. So I went there, I said, uh, let's create a win-win situation. So you like money, you love money. So I'll let you keep the whole amount because if I accept this payment, I have to live with the conscience that I either lied to you and gave you a wrong price, or I accepted the lie from you. Either, either part is not acceptable to my conscience. So I can live with a clean conscience and accept this payment, uh, not accept this payment, and let you have this whole money. And I will not sue you I will still, still sell you the material. I will not bad mouth you. Nobody will know in the industry. So it is a secret between the two of us. She so said, what? You're, you're letting go this money of almost a quarter million dollars check? So I said, look, this is my personal value system, which does not allow me to do this. So after that meeting, this guy called the engineer who specified our material. He was from New York, a Japanese firm. And he says, John, do you know this Ratanjit guy? I said, yeah, I know him very well. He says, this is what he's saying. He says, finally you met your match. What are you going to do? So go, go to Las Vegas, enjoy this money, gamble. He's not going to come after you. He said, but I can't sleep. <laughs> he says, that is your problem. So Ray, after a month and a half, I received the entire amount. 
So there is a conscience within all of us, which is being not nurtured. And then this gentleman, Ray, uh, after I sold my business to Dow Chemical in 2006, in 2010 or so, I was in Chicago airport and I saw somebody's leaving. I said, he comes, hey, Ratanji, the Ratanji, he comes to me running. And I says, you remember me? And then I suddenly remember, he says, you know, what you did that time has dramatically changed my life. I had two divorces before that. Now I am living a happy human being. You have basically transformed me because it made me think about myself. Wow. Wow, that's, I did know the earlier story, but I did not know about what happened subsequently. That is, that makes a, a great story that much better. Ratanji, it is time for us to take a quick break. We'll come back and talk about that story a little bit more because there's, there's more there to delve into. And our topic today, do values still matter? In this age of high technology and fast living, is that still something we should want to have in our life? We'll come back with this on Stress Free Living. We'll be right back. Wow, that's a good story. We'll come back and talk more about that on the air. That is, that's a wonderful story. Yes. It's a wonderful truth. <laughs> yes. 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 So this is the time here. We have about 90 seconds. If, if any of our guests would like to. Yeah, we'll in, up, uh, unmute question. and give us a question or a feedback or, or critique. Uh, Dr. Saab, Dr. Jigjit Singh Ji, uh, you have a feedback? Well, I, I feel uh, the first part in which what is correct and what is wrong is built by the society. Can you hear me? Uh, if we can hear you, yes. Okay. The part of what is right and what is wrong is built up by our social structure and social society. Hmm. And that is the reason when it changes when it has changed into a legal system, the society is changing what is bad and good, and they are deciding about it. So it is not the uh, oneness which is deciding what is good and bad, but the society is deciding. And then uh, once we are a child, that consciousness of good and bad is basically fit into our brains. Yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> so we are going to cover that in the, because uh, Ray generally wants me to <laughs> keep the final thing in the, for the last portion. Otherwise, he says, don't spill your beans. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Ji? Uh, oh. Sorry. Excellent point. Uh, what was coming? Oh, sorry, and sorry, we are sorry. back. We are live here back on the radio. We always have our great conversations with our Zoom callers during the breaks, and sometimes those are exciting and, and interesting, and we want to continue there, but we also have, of course, our radio show. And uh, <laughs> I should have mentioned in the beginning that uh, you can listen to us at wintradio.com anywhere in the world. Or you can also catch us in the Cleveland area at 101.5 FM or at 1330 AM. And our show is also recorded and put into YouTube. So we do have a Stress-Free Living YouTube channel, and you're welcome to go out and watch and listen to all of the shows. If you would like to be part of our Zoom audience, which we have whenever the show is done live on our Saturday morning time, and if you'd like to be a part of that, the Zoom link, you can find that on our website at WINT Radio in the Stress-Free Living section. And we urge you and, and encourage you to come back and join us. And that way we can be conversing with you uh, until the radio show starts again. And then I have to give you the, uh, I have to mute you because unfortunately <laughs> we go back to our show. Brett and Jeet, uh, some of the feedback enjoyed, uh, definitely enjoyed the story as I did. 
And uh, we got some other good comments from them that we'll work into a future show here too. Um, but let's go back to that, to that story because I like especially what that other person said in New York. He says, you've met your match, okay? <laughs> um, we, feed, we feed off of each other. As, as human beings, we, we, um, we respond in ways, you know, whatever game we're playing, we play with those players. And so when we're in circles with people that maybe are doing some things like that gentleman did, then we say, okay, we're going to play, we're going to play your game. And, and we change our values to kind of match the values of the people that we're playing with. So if people want to be legal, we get involved in legal battles. If people want to be um, high above board, we deal with them in that way. When they get nasty and, and mean, then we get nasty and mean back with them. In, in the business world, we seem to you know, measure up to the other players in the game. You met his, he met your, his match with you because he was operating at one level and you were obviously at a different level and you changed his life in, in the process. That may be an example as we've talked about here where can, can it really make a difference if you do what you do your way when the whole world is not. I, I think that may be the best lesson of your story is that because you stood by your values in a situation where it was so easy not to, it had a ripple effect now with everything else that that person did in his life and everybody else that he interacted with. I mean, you, you've just become a poster child for saying yes, even if you're the only person doing the right thing, do it because it does make a difference. See, the question we should ask, Ray, our parents tell us, be kind, be truthful, integrity is the key thing. And when you go to school, our teacher tell us, and we read books about all these. And um, so nobody tells us to cheat. Nobody tells us to lie, even in today's society. So why do we, why are we not able to carry out those value system which is given to us in a childhood? That is the fundamental question. So the, the, the answer to that is that all these values which are given to us, these values remain borrowed. They are not, they never become our true values. So they, they always remain as a borrowed values. That is why our commitment to those, because our inner being is not touched by those values. See, other side of the, to understand that is that Normally, we are told to become successful. Our emphasis in life is to be successful. We are quoted examples of people who are successful. And in today's time, especially, they are quoting examples of people who are successful in spite of the fact they have cheated, in spite of the fact they have, they're known to lie but somehow they succeeded. So we say, well, everyone lies, everyone cheats. So this is how- Rastanji, I think uh, as I am looking at him on the Zoom, you have frozen. And so we have temporarily lost the connection so, there with Rastanji. Hopefully he will be calling back in here. Must be a, there you go. We, yeah. you, fro you froze there for a moment, Rastanji. So are you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so you couldn't hear anything I said? Um, I don't know when we, I don't know what exactly was the last word that we heard you on, but we did lose some of your wisdom there for a moment, yes. Well, see, if I, was, I was saying that in, in our society today, that everyone is giving us a, a final destination, become successful. 
be somebody. So our, our entire thing is you have in, in school, we are told to be first in the class. So they, they don't say whether you cheat or no. And today's finding is in, there is close to 90 plus percent cheating going on in the exams. So this is because our race is to win somehow and and you see these professional athletes they do these enhancing drugs and they are they are illegal somehow if they are caught they are banned or they are otherwise many of them are never caught so in in life somehow or other we are supposed to win under any and all circumstance so if that is our objective, nobody gives us credit for being truthful. Nobody gives us credit for being honest. Nobody get, gives us credit for being kind or generous. In fact, that is considered as a weakness. So that is why we are never able to follow those values. You, you know, you, you always share your business stories and they're so much, they're so great. I know performance is an important part of business, but you just said earlier that character is used to be one of the criteria in dealing for getting loans and, and working with people. And it just seems that, that that, you know, for whatever reason, we don't consider that as an important aspect anymore. So the, the reason, Ray, all these value systems don't work or we don't, carry them out are because there is a difference between knowledge and knowing. Knowledge is somebody else's experience written up, I read, I understand. Somebody else's lecture I attend, I understand. Knowing is I experience through my living. I understand how I, it happened. So until knowing happens, I don't live those things. And knowing will not happen until we realize the truth about our own self. Wow, you just have so many nuggets of, of just gems. I, I just love that. I never thought of a difference between knowing and knowledge, but you're right. You are right. It, you said earlier, just before we, we had the internet connection loss, um, you said that, and I want to go back to it. I'm remembering it now that we have other people's values, but they don't become our own. All right. And, and that's the same idea with the knowledge. We can have other people tell us all kinds of things. We can read it in books and we can have professors lecture us on certain things that give us knowledge, but we really don't know it until we live it. Yes. And we really don't have other people's values in our lives, even if, even if our dad and, and, and our parents and our, high, our best loved mentors tell us things, they don't become our own values until we live them, until we, until we know them, as opposed to having knowledge of them. That, that, is, that is so powerful, those words. And, and I think when we come back from this next break, we have to talk about that jump. How, how do we do that jump? How do we teach our children, instead of just listening to me talk to you about values, about values giving you knowledge, how do we inspire them to actually make them their own, to, to implement the knowledge and have them know it. I think that may be a real critical aspect in this discussion. We're talking on stress-free living, trying to reduce the stress. Bertha, when you were talking about the CEOs earlier, I, I thought of this, um, all the CEOs that are out there that are, that are, you know, kind of walking that line between legalities and moralities and, and doing things that way. There's another aspect of, of those CEOs. They're almost all on high blood pressure medication. They're <laughs> almost all on uh, different other types of prescriptions to try to keep them calm 
and and that be so stressed out, um, maybe there's uh, maybe that's not coincidence, right? That that there's an incompatibility incompatibility going on within themselves. Within themselves, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We're on stress free living. We're trying to reduce our stress, and hopefully, we're helping you do that today. We'll be right back. All right. We, uh, again, we're, sh we're so sorry that we had to cut you off the last time, but you know, we yeah. had to go live. You're first this time. Uh, thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. A question that came up in the second uh, part of our show today is, yes, uh, we are always telling our kids, do this, do that. Uh, speaking truth is the right thing, and so on. Uh, and, and then, of course, we are pushing them to be uh, be the first one. I mean, be the get the highest grade, be first, blah blah blah. Where do we teach, or where do the kids learn to start cheating towards to to achieve their aim? How does that happen? Thank you. All right, I'll ask that question. We'll talk about that. Hmm. Dr. Singh or Darby, we have just a few seconds. Anything? Okay. Oh, nothing much. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, we have just a couple seconds. We do want to... Maybe we will come back with, uh, with that question that was just asked, Trip, and it is... Before we talk about learning values, where do we learn how to cheat? That's, that is a pretty good question. It seems like it's easier to learn how to cheat than it is to learn how to do things the right way. That's, is that our human nature? I know you don't like that term, but is it our human nature to always try to cut corners in an <laughs> easy way? Is it really true that 90% are willing to cheat? Is that yes, it? Yes, yes. That's scary. We are back on Stress-Free Living. So glad that we have the opportunity to interact with our Zoom audience uh, during these breaks. And we're just as grateful for each and every one of you that are in our listening and, and viewing audience, wherever you may be around the world. Thank you so much. Brentajit, uh, one of the questions that came up during our last break, you know, we're, we're going to talk about how do we get more knowing uh, and, and have more values for ourselves and for our young people. But the question was asked, where do we learn how to cheat? How, why is it so prevalent? If 90% of the students want to, want to cheat in a, on a, a, a exam, and earlier, I think you had said 90% of the people think that it's okay to steal a candy bar from a, from a grocery store or whatever if they're hungry. Yes. I mean, why, why is it so prevalent? Why, why is it so easy that we learn how to do that and are willing to do it? Is, is, that, is that part of our humanity too? No, very simple, Ray. In, in your lawn, if you stop watering a portion of the lawn, it'll, it'll die. It, the only portion which you water grows. So in our life, if you are a student in, in school as a child, and if you are telling the truth, you are being a nice person and everything, but your grade in school somehow drop. So all this goodness which you carry don't matter. The other side of the equation is, as long as your grade are good, and if you are obnoxious kid, people still say, well, he's, I can't fault with him. Look at his grades, look at her grades. She's brilliant, she's this, so we reward them, and so they know that they will be rewarded by, by the grace. So they have incentive to, by hook or crook, continue to have better grades. So they, we incentivize them in, in, in cheating. And plus, we have to remember, 
as a growing up child, we observe everything from mirror neurons in our brain. They are reflective. We copy our parents' habits. We copy our society's habits. We copy our teachers' habits. We don't truly follow what they ask us to do. So when in your conversation, your parents are telling, so, okay, the phone is ringing, so I'm not going to answer. He answers, he says, okay, tell him I'm not home. So now what have we taught our, our child? That it's okay to lie unconsciously. And then you are, you are sitting there in somebody's uh, home, you have been invited, they serve you food and the child doesn't like the food. So the parents don't like the food, but somehow they pretend that they had a dinner earlier, so they are not hungry, so they are not going to eat, but their food is delicious. And so your child says, gosh, they are lying. Food is not delicious. This is our food. <laughs> and, and so on and on and on. So we observe these things. So then as you grow up, this is as long as we pretend to be honest, it is how the game is played. As long as we can cheat, as long as nobody notices. So that this is how it is embedded in our, and then we constantly hear this thing, everyone cheats. It's a, you know, it's a once in a while, it's okay to cheat. So our value system to begin with is borrowed. It's not, it's coming from a knowledge base. Somebody has told us to be truthful. It, we have not understood why I should be truthful. What is the meaning of being uh, ethical and all that. So it is not through knowing, it is all through knowledge. So the knowing only happens when we wake ourselves up, Ray, we are never able to connect to my real me. I'm only operating in the shell of my human body. I am operating, building my entire life based on guided by my five senses of my human body. My human body is only a vehicle given to me and it has inherently built in needs. It is inherently want to protect itself is going to be filled with fear. It is inherently going to be hungry. It does not want to starve. It is going to be greedy. It is considers itself to be separate. It will have ego. So if I operate in the human body mode, which is all I know, which is all I am told to do, and I am going to follow the pleasure mode of five senses, what tastes good, what appears good, what looks good. So in that process, whatever I have to do is justifiable. So that is why our value system has no chance of surviving under that human body mode because it is part for what is in it for me. But once somebody makes us realize that I am not the human body, I am the power which enlivens the human body, then there is the same power which lies in somebody else. So there is no sense of lying to the same power which is within me and within others. Honesty happens. Boy, where do I start with after all of that wonderful words, all those wonderful words. The, let's go back to the idea of the difference between knowing and knowledge. When you've added all of these other things that are knowledge around us, including 
the mirror neurons, mirror neuron, neurons that that part of the knowledge that we accumulate is watching our parents, is watching our peers, watching our teachers and, and everybody else. And so part of the knowledge that we gain is that this is how you this is how you get around this rule. This is how you can get those good grades even if you don't study. This is how you you know this is the real world. Okay, you learn this, but this is really how it works. And that's how what people tell us. That's all part of that knowledge base that we are accumulating around us. It is understandable with all of that influence why we get confused in terms of what we really should do and how we really should act. I mean, when you think about all those things and you give some great examples of, you know, we're not hungry, we already had dinner or we're going to dinner when you see what the food is around there. It, it, it's, those are so real that those, those, I've never done that to you, Rathanji. Everything that your wife has always made, everything Dolly's made has always been spectacular. But, but it's, it's true. The example is true that that's what we, that's what our children see the parents do. So let's again shift to the idea of the knowing Okay, how, how do we teach our children? Let's start with that. How do we teach our children that you, you need to execute on these items? You need to take that jump from everything that you've heard, everything that you've read and seen and, and witnessed, and you need to act in this way. It, it, is that possible that we can make that act of knowing be done in a moral way, be done with value so that the, our children know they do matter? Well, see, Ray, you cannot teach with the borrowed knowledge. You have to have knowing yourself first. Our parents wants their children to grow up great, but they're hidden agenda is always that they want them to be successful. Somehow or other, that success is measured by the money. The success is measured by what they possess. They don't value their morality. They don't value their own morality because they are also operating in the five senses, the human body mode. They have not realized themselves who they are. How can they teach their children? They, have, they are coming from knowledge base. They are not coming from knowing base. And that is why it doesn't matter how many PhDs we have. It doesn't matter how many books we have written. It doesn't matter how many Nobel prizes we have. Knowing is still coming from understanding who you are. The real you is the power, the enlivening power which is present within you. We have even segregated God. When you and God, there's two entities, they exist. Neither God exists nor you exist. When they become one, then you disappear, only God exists. Then only God is present. Otherwise, we are chasing falsehoods. So whether we are in the religion base or we are in the best college or university or we are in politics or we are at home, we are all part in falsehood. And that is why the truth skips from us and true values only come from first understanding what the real truth is. All our values fall out of that truth. Once you realize that truth 
is who I am. Truth is the power which enlivens me, whether you call it God or universal power, it doesn't matter. But that power, when you begin to see in the eyes of another fellow human being, you have automatically incentive to serve the divine power. So when serving the divine power, you cannot be part in uh, un untruth. You have to be honest. You have to, because you cannot cheat the ultimate power which knows everything. Ratanjit, as I'm listening to the importance of your words, the, the great, brilliant significance of that on our life and on our children to teach them this, I can't help but think that as, as incredibly powerful and empowering as that is, our young people are being barraged by a world that is not saying that. And they're, they're seeing the celebrities and the superstar athletes and the, and the um, multi-billionaire multi CEOs of famous companies that are out there in, on a world stage. And they don't even hide it. They don't even hide the fact that they're cheating, that they've cheated on the way up the ladder. And maybe they're still cheating on a daily basis. So... How can, we, how can we get this message, your empowering truth, how do we communicate that through all of this world that is not saying this? So there, there, is, a, there is a beautiful saying in, in scriptures. It says, the, the pain is the medicine. And the pleasure is the disease. You know, we are constantly given challenges in our life to wake us up, Ray. We are given sicknesses, we are given drawbacks. Or, or, so all these things are waking us up. Otherwise, society is going in a very wrong direction. We have about six hundred hit groups in USA. We have anti-government registered group of 800. We have 10,000 cults in this country. And in spite of being the richest country on this face of earth, America, 43% families barely can afford or they can't afford a day-to-day -day requirements of healthcare, food, shelter, and school, and all that. And this is the state of affairs. And I can go on and on. And, and this is exactly what is going to happen to the human race. We are going to end up disintegrating ourselves. All this technology, which is great on one side, is creating uh, amazing crooks. In 2018, cyber crime was $600 billion. And this year, it is going to be estimated to be $6 trillion. Rathanji, with that, I'm so sorry, but we are out of time. So we just need to say, we answer the question, do values matter? Absolutely, they matter more than ever. We'll have to continue this in terms of where do we go from here? How do we get this message across and change, help to change our world today and for the future? Ratanji, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, your love, your wisdom with us and to all of our other guests and to our listeners everywhere. Thank you so much. Remember, we're all playing the same game. Thank you so much. Okay.